So we're talking about quadratics. So everybody familiar with what a quadratic is in terms of it's just a second degree polynomial. Uh, it has something to the second, it has an x to the second power. If it doesn't have an x to the second power, uh, if it's got an x, just an x, it's linear. It's just a straight line. If it's got a cube, then it's one of those weird, you know, S-E shaped curves, okay? So we're just talking, for, for this section, we're just talking about quadratics. We're talking about parabolas. So if we've got some given parabola, we'll say this one is centered at zero. Then that point, that low point, right, is called the vertex. And it represents the minimum value of that parabola. It's the, it's the x value that gives you a minimum, okay? Uh, generally, when we talk about minimum and maximum, x is what we're plugging in. And it's the x value associated with, but the actual minimum value is the y value, okay? So if I say x gives me 4, then 4 is the actual minimum. x is just the value that gives me that minimum. Okay, so when you're doing word problems and stuff, you want to make sure you understand what coordinate you're looking for, x or y. Okay. Now, notice that it is an even function, just x squared. If we don't, you know, have an x in there, if it's just x squared, it's an even function, which means it's symmetric on either side of the axis. Are we all familiar with even and odd functions? I know that's in chapter one, isn't it? Even and odd functions, or is it in two? It's hard to remember where this stuff is, but it has to do with the, 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 the symmetry of something. So if it's even, that means that all of the exponents are even or a constant. So I could have x squared is even because the two is even. Uh, x squared plus x is not even. It's not odd because I have one even exponent, one odd exponent. That means it's neither even nor odd, okay? If I had x squared plus 3, that one would still be even because a constant is considered an even term. Okay? We're just talking about x squared, though. So we've got our vertex for x squared is centered at 0, 0. That's the vertex. We have a standard equation. A times x minus h squared plus k. This is the standard equation of a parabola. For this, the vertex is hk. Now, h is the number inside the parentheses. k is the number on the outside of the parentheses. Okay? If you don't have parentheses, then h is just 0. If it's just x squared, h is 0. If you're not adding a number by itself, then k is 0. That's why just x squared has a vertex at 0, 0, because there's no h, there's no k. The a lets you know whether you're talking about an up parabola or a down parabola. If a is positive, then it's going up. It's happy. It's a smiley face, right? That's a happy. Now, if it's negative, let's keep that in mind. Then it's. He looks mad. But negative, sad, smile, you know, frowny face. So that's how we remember. So let's look at an actual equation. Y equals two times x minus one squared plus three. Now, what is my vertex going to be? Now, remember that vertex, let's, let's write under it. The, the equivalent version, right? The, the standard form of a parabola. So we can look at it and kind of see if our vertex is hk, right? We've got 1 and 3. So that tells us where our vertex is, okay? So I know it's a vertex. Is it opening up or is it opening down? It's positive, so it's opening up. So vertex is at 1, 
three, and it's opening up. So in a sketch, I'm not so much worried about any other points. Here in just a minute, we'll get to how to make it a, a cleaner uh, representation. But for now, it's just good enough to know that we know how to find the vertex, and we know whether it's opening up or down. Okay. Now, be aware. Let me do this. What if I've got 3 times x plus 4 squared minus 7? Right. That inside parentheses, so notice that our standard form has x minus h. Because of that minus sign in the standard form, we are always going to change the sign of whatever's inside the parentheses for our h value. Okay. So since we've got plus 4, that means our vertex has to have a minus 4. Okay. The one on the outside has a plus, right, plus k, so we're going to keep that sign. It's going to stay the same. So we change the sign inside the parentheses. We leave the sign on the outside of the parentheses. So we get negative 4, negative 7. Does that make sense? Okay. Here it's still a positive parabola, so it's still going up. So we could graph it by 1, 2, 3, negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, negative 7 and it's going up. That's the beautiful part. That's the good part. That's the kind we hope we see because standard form is not difficult at all. You can look at it, you can find the vertex, you can graph it. Okay. Now, what we worry about is when it is not in standard form, when it's in general form. So general form is ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. This is the one that's a little it's a little trickier. There's one formula that you have to memorize, and that's that h is equal to negative b over two a. K is f of h. What we're saying is we're going to find h. That's going to give us our x value. To find our y value, we just plug the x in. Okay, f of h, h being the x value, right? So for this one, well, I haven't given you one, have I? Let's create one. Say we've got negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. Okay. So we look at this and we say, okay, what is a? a is the number in front of x squared. So what's the number in front of x squared? Negative 1. Okay. Everybody good with that? Make sure that understood 1 is there, so don't let it trip you up. So a is negative 1. What is b? B is the number in front of X, right? So what's the number in front of X? Negative 2. Okay. C I don't really care about for this type of problem, but it's good to go ahead and say, what is C? C is the number by itself. It's 1. Okay. So we're given that H equals negative B over 2A. Now be aware that this minus sign is part of the problem. So I can write this as negative times 2, right, just changing those letters into parentheses so that I don't get lost in my signs. Because that tends to be a problem with a lot of students is that minus sign trips you up, particularly when B happens to be negative, and what it is in this case. So if I, if I write it this way and just change all of the letters into parentheses, then I can drop the values into those parentheses. So B is negative 2, and A is negative 1. So if I do it this way, now I can see that I've got negative negative 2. So what's, what happens with a double negative? It becomes positive 2. And then on the bottom, I've got 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2. And then what's 2 divided by negative 2? Negative 1. So that gives me an h value of negative 1. So to find k, I'm going to find f of negative 1. I'm just going to plug negative 1 back into my equation. So once again, I'm going to rewrite my equation using parentheses. 
All I do is take out the x and put parentheses in, and now I can drop my value of h in. It's negative 1. Now, one thing you cannot do, I have a negative negative, right? I can't turn that into positive 1. Why not? Absolutely, you got to do your order of operations, right? It tells us we have to do exponents first. So, we're going to say negative 1 squared is positive 1. And then we can do the multiplication here. What's negative 2 times negative 1? Positive 2 and then plus 1. So we do negative 1 plus 2 plus 1 is just going to give us 2. So that gives us our k. So we've got hk, which is our vertex. Now, is a positive or negative? a is negative. This is going to be going down. Okay. So A, the rule about A still applies. If A is positive, we're going up. If A is negative, we're going down. So negative 1, 1, 2. There's our vertex, and it's going down. Okay, any questions on that? What do you mean? Like when it came out problem, does it say like change it and put the first thing? How is he going to ask where's the first digit? Generally, it, it might say just, you know, what's the vertex of this parabola? And it could be in either form. And you've got to be able to do it in both ways. Now, we can take general form and put it in standard form by completing the square, but most students don't want to do that. It's just extra step that's really cumbersome. Now, I don't know whether he does complete the square at this point. You know, some teachers might, but I wouldn't. I, I don't see any point in doing completing the square, but have you have you done have y'all done completing the square? So, you know how to do it in theory. We can do it. Like, let's look at this problem. Y'all don't have to do this. Y'all can just watch me and follow along as I'm doing it so that you can see what I'm doing. So, we're going to look at negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. So the first thing I have to do is group my square term and my x term together and then leave the number by itself. So I've got negative x squared minus 2x and then I put the plus 1 out here just to separate them. Now to complete the square you cannot have a number on your x squared. So you have to factor anything out of that x squared. Okay. So we're going to factor a negative 1 out. It's going to leave me with a positive x squared and a positive 2x. Okay? So we take half of 2x, which is 1, we square 1. So we're going to add 1. But did we add 1? No, we actually subtracted 1 because we have to multiply this number on the outside. So we actually subtracted 1, so that means we're going to have to add 1 here to offset if I subtract one, I also have to add one. They have to offset each other. Does that make sense? Okay. You would add it on the inside. If this were an equation equal to something, you would add it on this side and add it on this side. Oh. But since we don't have an equal sign, we have to offset it. If we add it, we also have to subtract it because they'll cancel each other out. And since here, although we said plus 1, it's really minus 1 because of this minus 1 outside. So we subtracted 1 here. To make it not change, we have to add 1 as well. So we add another one. So this and this cancel out. Okay. So what does that give us here? We've got a negative 1 on the outside. This is just x plus 1 squared. If you don't remember how to do that, it's always x, whatever half of that middle term was. And since half of 2x is positive 1, it's x plus 1. 
And then on the outside, we've got 1 plus 1, which is 2. So now we can look at it and say the vertex is the opposite of this one, so negative 1, and then this is k. Negative 1, 2, same value. And we know that the outside is negative, so it's going down. Okay, You can do it either way. If you feel comfortable using completing the square to put it back into that standard form, you can. But we learn the negative b over 2a, so we don't have to do that. Okay, That makes sense. It works, but there's no reason to reinvent the wheel every time. They tell you you can do it by using negative b over 2a. You can do it. Okay. So now we know how to find the vertex. We know how to determine whether something is opening up or opening down. Now we have to actually get some points in there so we can kind of define how wide the parabola is, you know, things like that. So we have to find the x-intercepts. We have to find the y-intercepts. Okay. So let's look at a different problem. Let's do negative 3x squared plus 6x minus 13. So this is our function f of x. So this is in general form. So we can't just look at it and get the vertex. So we're going to have to use the fact that h equals negative b over 2a. All right, so what is b? b is 6. And what is a? Negative 3. So that gives us negative 6 on the top. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 on the bottom. Negative 6 divided by negative 6 is positive 1. So our h is 1. So our k, we're going to plug that in. Plug in 1. Well, 1 squared is just 1, so we got negative 3 times 1. 6 times 1 is 6, minus 13. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, plus 6 minus 13. So negative 3 plus 6 minus 13 is negative 10. So our vertex is going to be 1, negative 10. All right, so now we need to find our x-intercepts and our y-intercepts. So how do we find x-intercepts? The x-intercepts. An x-intercept means that it's on the x-axis, which means it has no y value, right? The y is equal to 0. Yeah, you set it equal to 0. Because remember, if we're going to have an, an intercept means one of our values is 0. If we're looking for the y-intercept, x is 0. If we're looking for the x-intercept, y is 0. And in a function, f of x means y. This means y. So what we're really doing is we're just setting the equation equal to 0 to find the x-intercepts. So we say negative 3x squared plus 6x minus 13 equals 0. All right. Sometimes you can do that, but not when it's in this general form. If it's in general form where you've got an x term, now if you didn't have an x term, you could do that, take the square root of both sides, that sort of thing. But since it's in this general form with an a, b, and a c, what we really have to do is we have to figure out a way to either factor it or use the quadratic equation. Okay. You can always try to factor and use the quadratic equation. Those, that method always works. Now, if it doesn't, like I said, if it didn't have the 6x term, then maybe I could move the 13 over because then I could just take the square root of both sides and get rid of the x squared. But we've got it in this one, so we're going to have to factor it. So we're going to look at it and say, is there any way to factor this without using the quadratic equation. 
most of the time we can't really tell, you know, particularly when it's got crazy numbers like this. This one is kind of easy to tell that, you know, it's not going to factor it cleanly. Uh, and remember, quadratic equation always works. Even if it will factor, quadratic equation still works. So instead of spending five minutes trying to figure out whether it'll factor or not, a lot of times it's just quicker to just use the quadratic equation, particularly if you've got it memorized. Okay? Does everybody have the quadratic equation memorized? If you don't, there's a song. I'm going to show you something. There are a lot of different songs, but I'm going to show you one in particular. Let's see. That's my daughter. <laughs> and we, the reason that I did this, the reason that I taught her that was to shame my wife into learning it who was taking Math 100 at the time. And she's like, I can't ever remember. I'm like, oh, you're about to learn it because I'm going to teach it to our daughter <laughs> and she's going to shame you into doing it. So, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's one to rolling in the deep. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different ones, you know. So if you can go and find one that sticks in your head and, it's so funny because that one, when we, I do, I always play that for my classes. I do the actual one from, that does somebody singing it, and it gets in your head, and you know you're just walking down the hall going the quadratic formula, you know, I stop it. I, in my in my class, I actually, you know, when I'm writing, I'm like, b squared minus four ac, and I stop, and I've got like five or six students that go all over to a, <laughs> so. So we're gonna use. The quadratic formula. All right, so you got negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, right. So the key is we've got a equals negative 3, b equals 6, and c equals negative 13. So this is going to give us negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 6 squared minus 4 times negative 3 times negative 13 all over 2 times negative 3. So that's negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 36. A negative times a negative times a negative is negative. 12 times 13 is 144, 156. over negative 6. Now you're going to get negative 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 120 over negative 6. What's the problem with that? you got a no negative under a radical. That means there's no real solution, no x-intercept. Right, they're only imaginary. So what this means is my parabola opens in such a way as to not cross the x-axis. Okay? So whenever I'm doing this, I know I can't cross the x-axis. I have no x-intercept. Okay? All right, so we let y be 0 to solve for the x-intercepts. Now we're going to let x be 0 to solve for the y-intercept. So if I let x be 0, that gives me negative 3 times 0 squared plus 6 times 0 minus 13. Now that goes away, that goes away, and you just have negative 13. The y-intercept. And you'll find that in general form, the y-intercept is c. 
because the x terms should both cancel out because they're multiplying by zero. So we can graph now and get a little bit better. Oh, one other thing before we graph it. And that's the axis of symmetry. Remember how when I first said it, I said that it was an even function, which means it had that symmetry across the y-axis. No matter where we move it, it's always going to have symmetry. It just won't be a, across the y-axis. It'll be across this line going down the middle called the axis of symmetry. Okay? The axis of symmetry is always a, an equation. X equals whatever the x-coordinate of that vertex is because it has to go right through the middle of the vertex. So if we know what the vertex is, then we know what the axis of symmetry is. Since the vertex here is 1, negative 10, that means the axis of symmetry is x equals 1. So I know that anything that happens to the right of x equals 1 will also happen to the left of x equals 1. This lets us get a couple of points. If we can get one point on this side, then we automatically are going to get a, a point on the other side. Okay? So now, let's change the color so I can see it a little better. That's not going to work. I need a much bigger. You know what? I'm just going to go to a different page. 1, negative 10 is my vertex. x equals 1 is my axis of symmetry. And 0, negative 13 is my y intercept. So 1, negative 10. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I know that that's my axis of symmetry is through 1. Now, I know A is negative, so that tells me that we're going to be opening down. I don't really need that information because I know what the y-intercept is. The y-intercept is at negative 13. So I can see fairly clearly do that, that it's going to you know, have to go down like that. Now, since I have symmetry across that x-axis, if I went one over here, that means I'm going to have to go one over here Bless you. And so that tells me what it's going to look like on the other side. Okay? Does that make sense? To any Now make sure when, when we do this that if you've got a question, stop me and ask me. With only four people in here, there's definitely, you should feel, and I know you all know each other, so you should be comfortable asking questions. You should be comfortable asking questions in any math class. No, I know. Is Nobody is, but you shouldn't be. This is, my, this is my philosophy of math. If you knew how to do it, you wouldn't be in here. Ask questions. You, you shouldn't be expected to know how to do it. Oh, now, now, let me tell you something. <laughs> you have a large section of math teachers who believe that you took Math 100. You are a master of Math 100 now. Okay. No one, no one is a master of Math 100 that's taking Math 112. There's not going to be, unless you're retaking it just because you want to, you know, have fun. But I did that. I am a math major. I actually came back and took, I've taken every math class at Calhoun just because I wanted to have the experience of taking all of them. So, and it works for me because I like math. Now, I recognize that y'all are not mathematicians, are not going to grow up to be mathematicians, okay? So, everything that you push in, you probably cram. You're probably not good math studiers. Okay?
to be an effective math studier, you have to do every day. You have to do math every day. You can't do math once a week, twice a week, and then just cram it all in right before the test. It'll pass the test sometimes, no. depending on the teacher, <laughs> depending on the test. But that's generally, and that's, most, that's the way most people do math. We, we're going to look at it like once or twice a week and just try to cram in right there at the end. Okay, so it's not effective for most people, particularly in a course that is comprehensive, that's learning as you go, and then you get to the end and you've got to take a comprehensive final. So most people bomb finals because they didn't study the right way during the semester. So I'm not telling you to go out and change the way you're studying because you're not going to. So uh, be aware that there are math teachers that understand that. And I'm one of them. And after today, you will have my email address because I want to send you the stuff. If you got any questions, just let me know. Okay, Come to the lab. Come ask for help. It's the only way to learn. Okay. Uh, that being said, we can get back to this. So now we want to talk about applications of this. We're going to talk about maximizing and minimizing. To do a max and min problem, like I said, all we're really doing is trying to find a parabola and then find its vertex. Because if we've got that, then we know that it's either a maximum or a minimum. Okay? So if we look at some problem, an archer's arrow follows a parabolic path. I know I start doing a word problem and people are like, my heart starts going fast, I, my hands are sweating. Don't let it. It's just, it's just the English equivalent of the same things that we're doing. So we say that an archer's arrow follows a parabolic path. Now, par parabolic just means a parabola, okay? So don't get hung up in the terminology. So we've got f of x equals negative 0 0.005x squared plus 2x plus 5. x represents the distance in feet and f of x represents the parabola itself. So x is the x, and then f of x is the y associated with, because you know, we're talking about shooting an arrow in a parabola. I know y'all have all at least seen people shoot arrows, how they, they arc. They make a parabola. So the maximum height will be the vertex of the parabola that has just been created. Okay. So we've got the equation here that tells us that this is the parabola that we're creating. So if I want to know what the max height is, well, I just find the vertex. Okay. So what's the highest point that he's going to hit? Well, let's find h is negative b over 2a. Two times negative point zero zero five is point zero one. Negative point zero one. Negative divided by negative is positive. Two divided by point zero one is two hundred. Okay. Now, what does H represent? That's the x value of the vertex, right? So that is how far out we are at the maximum height but it doesn't give us the maximum height itself. Remember, the maximum value is always going to be found by finding that y value, by finding k. Okay? So we've got h. How do we find k? We plug it in. I may have to pick that up. That's just cheesy enough to stick in people's heads. So you've got 200 squared, which is... 40,000 times negative 0 0.005. 2 times 200 is 400 plus 5. All right, so you've got a calculator. What's 0 0.005 times 40,000? 40, hmm? Negative 200 plus 400 plus 5. So that's going to be 200 plus 5, 205. So that tells us that the maximum height is 205 feet, and it occurs 200 feet away from the archer. 
Okay. So if we look at this as it's happy to be shooting an arrow. It's not to scale. Okay? So we see what these values represent. The X value, the Y value. The X value is how far away we have shot it, and 205 is how far up it was. Okay? And that's the key to a lot of word problems is figuring out exactly what it's asking. That's like 90% of word problems is making sure you understand what it's asking. Now, you get a little more challenging when you talk about maximizing a value that you're not given. I know this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but say I've got some amount of perimeter, some amount of fencing. Okay, I've got so many feet of fencing. And I want to maximize the area that I enclose with this fencing. Okay, I don't really have a quadratic equation in there. Right? Because area is length times width. Perimeter is, you know, two times the length times, or plus two times the width. So it's all very linear, but there's two variables. So anytime you come across a problem that has two variables, which is what all, almost all of our maximizing and minimizing problems are going to do, we have to solve one of the equations and maximize the other one. Okay? So that's what I'm going to show you how to do. Say I've got 100 yards of fencing. And I want to enclose a rectangular area. Okay. I want to find the dimensions of that rectangle that maximize the area enclosed. Okay. So, what do I know? I know I got 100 yards of fencing. I know I got a rectangular area. That's all I know. We're going to call this length and width. Because I need formulas. I need the perimeter formula. I need the area formula. Those are the two pertinent things. Because I'm told I have 100 yards of fencing. That's going to be the perimeter, right? So the perimeter is the, the sum of all the sides, right? So length, width, length, width. So perimeter is 2L plus 2W. And what is our perimeter equal to? How much fencing do I have? 100 yards. So that's going to be equal to 100. Okay? Now, my other equation is the area. Area of a rectangle is length times width. And that's what I want to maximize. It's asking for the maximum area enclosed. So I need to make that a quadratic somehow, which means since I'm multiplying L and W, I need either L to be a W or W to be an L somehow. Well, that's easy to do. All we have to do is go back to the perimeter formula and solve it for either L or W. Okay? So, let's solve it for L. So we're going to take 2L plus 2W equals 100. And we want to solve it and get L by itself. So what's the first thing I have to do? Subtract 2W from both sides. That gives me 2L equals 100 minus 2W. It's not going to be 98W, right? That 100 doesn't have a W on it, so they're, they're not like terms. So let's make sure and keep them apart. Now I want L by itself, so what do I got to do? Divide everything by 2. So L is going to be 50 minus W. Now that I've solved the first equation for a variable, I can plug that variable into the second equation. So I'm going to take this and put it in there at L. So I'm going to have 50 minus W times W. Okay, you see how I just changed the W or the L into 50 minus W. So now I'm going to multiply that 
it gives me 50w minus w squared. All right, so this gives me, if I put it in general form, I always want it in descending order, right? So that's negative w squared plus 50w. Make sure you keep the sign to the left of, of the uh, term with it. All right, now I've got a quadratic. So how am I going to find the maximum value? Quadratic, what ha where's the maximum occur? At the vertex. Okay, so that's all I got to do is I find the vertex. So my H is negative B over 2A. Negative 50 over 2 times negative 1. That gives me the x value, the h, of 25. Well, this all this really represents is this, the, the w. Okay? So this gives me my width. Because remember, it's width on one side, area is actually the height. So by solving for h, I've really solved for the width, what I was looking for. So I know that if the width is 25, I can take it and plug it up here. Length is equal to 50 minus W. And it will also be 25. No. That's the dimensions of the, this is the length and the width, 25 and 25. We didn't actually find the entire vertex. We just found the x coordinate of the vertex because it's the only one I really need. What would the y value be? What would that k, what would k represent in the vertex? What am I maximizing? The area. So I could plug that 25 into that formula and get the area. But I can also just multiply 25 times 25 because that's what area is, length times width. Either way. So the dimensions that give us the maximum amount are 25 yards by 25 yards. And then the area that it is, we just multiply 25 by 25. So 625 yards would be the maximum area enclosable. And that really gives us a insight into uh, maximizing an area. The maximum area, the maximum size of a rectangle will always be a square. So if you get a problem like this, be aware that it's always going to give you a square. That's a shortcut to maximizing a rectangular region. So if I know I have 100 yards of fencing and I want to do a rectangle, I know that all four sides have to be the same because it's a square. So I divide 100 by 4, I get that each side has to be 25. That's a shortcut, but one that always works as long as you actually have four sides. Now, if you had a problem that said something like, I wanted to build a fence along a river, so I only need three sides, then you couldn't do that because you don't have that fourth side of fencing. So you can't guarantee that it's going to be a square. All right. So you got questions on this one? That's pretty much all of 2.2. Finding vertex and then using it to find the maximum. Do you have any other questions? Uh, I think Nancy said that uh, the, her, the 100 students were going to come Thursday, so I don't know if y'all are coming back on Thursday or not. Yeah, because uh, we went to 
Yeah, I'm available. There's a lot of stuff involved in graphing polynomials. The and that's really one of the easier concepts because really all all multiplicity is I, I, once it's explained to you you'll be like oh well, that's it because really what we're talking about is we're solving for the zeros okay does everybody understand what solving for the zeros is okay we're going to set the equation equal to zero and we're going to factor it we're going to do what we have to so that we can solve the equation equals zero. So if you've got something like, give an example. Say you've got, I don't like that one. Negative x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus 4x squared. This is our function. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the leading coefficient test. Okay? Is the leading coefficient positive or negative? It's negative. Okay? So we know that it's negative. Then we ask ourselves, is the leading coefficient uh, or is the leading term an even exponent? or an odd exponent? It's even, okay? So that's the other question. So we talk about uh, leading coefficient, the exponent, x to the fourth power. It's just the exponent on the leading term. The exponent on the leading term. The exponent on leading term. Is even. <laughs> All right, so we know, or we should know, if we don't know, we need to learn. Even leading terms always look like a parabola. They rise left and right, okay? So even normally looks like this. Well, looks like this. Oh, wrong way. Evens always rise and rise. Odd always fall and rise. So it doesn't matter what the actual equation is or what the actual exponent is. If it's even, it's going to be rising on both sides. If it's odd, it's going to be falling to the left and rising to the right. However, the leading coefficient test is how we determine what it's really doing. If it's positive, then this is true. If it's negative, then it flips it all. Okay? So a negative leading coefficient means it's frowny face. It's going to flip the even so that they're both going down. It's going to flip the odd so it's rising to the left and falling to the right. So this is standard. But a negative leading coefficient flips the standard. So for this one, it's x to the fourth, but it's negative x to the fourth. So that means it's going to be falling to the left and falling to the right. Okay. So now we have to find 
intercepts. And that's going to be done by finding the zeros of the function. So to find the zeros of the function, we set the equation equal to zero. So negative x to the fourth plus 4x four cubed minus 4x squared equals zero. Okay? If you forget what finding a zero means, set it equal to zero. That's what the zero means. It's the values that give us zero. So we're going to have to factor this. Well, it's an x to the fourth term, so I don't really know a way to factor x to the fourth unless I have a greatest common factor. Do they all have a greatest common factor? They all have x squared in them, right? x to the fourth has an x squared, x cubed has an x squared, x squared has an x squared. So the x squared is our common factor. So we're going to factor that x squared out. Not only are we going to factor an x squared out, but because our leading term is negative, we're going to factor a negative x squared out. You always want to factor a minus sign out if your leading term is negative. Okay? So this gives us negative x squared as our greatest common factor. And what do we have left if we factor a negative x squared out of a negative x to the fourth? We just have x squared. What about out of 4x cubed? Is it positive or negative? If, if we pull a negative out of a positive, it's going to make it negative. All right, and what about out of 4x squared? It's going to be positive 4. All right. So now we've got to say, well, can I factor x squared minus 4x plus 4? Are there two numbers that multiply to be positive 4 and add to be negative 4? Negative 2 and negative 2. We've got negative x squared equals 0. So now we factored it. The principle of zero products tells us that to get things to be 0 by multiplying, one of those things has to be 0. Okay? So we're going to set each factor independently equal to 0. What does x squared mean? x times x, right? So I can write this as x times x times x minus 2 times x minus 2, right? So those are technically all of the factors. And then you've got that negative 1. And the reason I do this is because you want to make sure you know how many factors there are and exactly what they are. So I'm going to set each one of these equal to 0. Negative 1 can never be 0, so I don't have to worry about the negative 1. But I say x equals 0, x equals 0, x minus 2 equals 0, x minus 2 equals 0. I just set each one. Negative 1 can't be 0, right? So we don't worry with it. Any number that we factor out just kind of goes away because anything can't be 0, right? So if x minus 2 equals 0, what is x equal to? x equals 2, x equals 2. So notice here we've only got two answers. We've actually got 0 and 2, right? So our two zeros are 0 and 2. Those are going to be our x-intercepts. But now comes the concept of multiplicity. Multiplicity just means how many times did it show up as a solution? How many times did 0 show up? How many times did 2 show up? Both of them have a multiplicity of 2. That's all multiplicity is. It's how many times they're a solution. So x equals 0. That means 0 is a solution twice. Multiplicity is 2. Mm -hmm. 2 shows up twice. Therefore, the multiplicity of 2 is 2. So 0 is a solution. Multiplicity of 2. 2 is a solution. Ooh. 2 is a solution. Multiplicity of 2. Now, why is multiplicity important? Multiplicity tells us whether we cross the axis or if we just approach it, touch it, and turn. Okay? Normally, multiplicity of 1 just crosses right through it. Multiplicity of 2 touches and turns. Okay? 
even multiplicities touch and turn. Odd multiplicities cross. I'm talking about multiplicity, not whether the value itself is even or odd. Okay? If I got the solution 1, if x equals 1 with a multiplicity of 2, just because 1 is odd doesn't have anything to do with the multiplicity being even. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you understand where I'm getting multiplicity? Yes. Okay. Do you understand that the multiplicity is an even number, too? Yes. Okay. As long as the multiplicity is even, then it's going to touch and turn from the x-axis. It's not going to cross the x-axis. It's going to hit it and turn around. If the multiplicity had been odd, 1, 3, 5, any odd number, then it's going to cross the x-axis. Okay. All right, so, so far we've got 0 and 2, both with a multiplicity of 2. We know that it's going to be rising to the, or falling to the left and right. Now we need to find the y-intercept. Well, how do we find the y-intercept? We're just going to take the equation and set x equal to 0. Zero. Zero to the fourth plus zero cubed minus zero squared. All of them are zero, right? So that tells us that our y, these were x-intercepts. This is y-intercept. Okay? Now, If we have x-intercepts at 0 and 2, 0 and 2, we know we're falling to the left, falling to the right, and that because of the multiplicities of our zeros, we're not actually going to cross the axis, we're just going to touch. Then I can kind of get a basic shape of this graph. It's going to come up, it's going to touch and turn around, but then it's got to go back up and touch and turn around here. We knew the y-intercept was 0, which we know that from x equals 0 anyway, because x equals 0 means y equals 0. But do you see how that multiplicity comes into play? If I didn't recognize that multiplicity means that it's going to touch and turn, then I might try to make it look like this. Right? This is the, if you didn't know about multiplicity, this is how you would have graphed that. But that's completely wrong in that little interval right there you have to come back down and go back up. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. And that's how you're going to graph every one of these, is you're going to just take it a step at a time. Factor it, find the x-intercepts, determine the multiplicity, find the y-intercept, and then graph it knowing what that end behavior is because of the leading coefficient test. It doesn't, it's not super challenging. More than anything, it takes practice. And it just takes doing a couple of them, making sure that you're following the steps and making sure that A, you remember your basic end behaviors and what a leading coefficient test tells you, and then two, what the multiplicity tells you. If you've got those things, then you can graph any of these.
Okay? Any question? No? Okay, so what we did was we, the degree and the leading coefficient, those are the two things that we lumped together as the leading coefficient test. Okay. That tells us our end behavior completely. Because if it's positive, it does one thing. If it's negative, it does another thing. And, and that's, that's, that's how you do it. And then number of possible zeros, I don't care how many possible zeros there are. I want to know how many there are. Right? I'm going to solve for every possible one, and that's going to give me my multiplicities. Number of possible turning points is a way that we can test our graph and look and verify that it makes sense. The number of possible turning points is always one less than the degree of the exponent. Okay, since this is a fourth degree, then I can have at most three turns. So let's count our turns here. We got one turn, two turn, three turns. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's one less than the degree of the polynomial. The end behavior is based on whether the degree is even or if the degree is odd. Is that real? Because it's going to multiply your exponents. And then, I don't know. Like right here, you're going to add your exponents to that. No, you're going to add your exponents. Yeah, you add your exponents. That's going to tell you how many total zeros you're going to have. If you add the exponents, it tells you the degree of the power, the, the degree of the polynomial. So this one, because this is two, this is like an x squared, this is like an x cubed, x squared and x cubed gives you x to the fifth. So you know this is going to be a five. Okay. So that tells us that it's going to be falling to the left and rising to the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will also give you the total sum of the multiplicities. So for this one, I had two multiplicities of two. If you add two plus two, it just gives you four, which we know that's how many possible solutions you should have. Graphing rationals or graphing uh, polynomials. 112. I did 100 earlier. Now I'm doing 112. No, that was earlier. <laughs> A lot of that stuff that you've gotten written down are things that can combine to be something else in there. It, it is. It is the long route. And it's, Im it's important to know some of this stuff, like the fact that if you add up the multiplicities, you should get the degree of the polynomial. I mean, that's a way you can use to test and check and make sure you've done it right, that, that you haven't missed one in there somewhere. A lot of, and the same way with uh, turning points. They're really checks that you use to verify that what you're doing is correct more than what you need to actually graph. Does that make sense? Yeah, you didn't have class Monday. You can do it. You just want to just go ahead and plan to meet the same time on Thursday? Because uh, yeah. y'all don't, you normally have ball on Tuesday and Thursday, right? Yeah, but but not this week. Okay. So we'll do one, we'll do one o'clock on Thursday. Can we do that? Would you like do the spelling? Mm-hmm. It does, but for a sketch, we don't really care. You know, if we want to be precise, what we would have to do is we would have to plug that value in, x equals 1, to see how far down it dips. Okay. So if I plug in 1, I get negative 1 plus 4 minus 4, which is just negative 1. So it goes down to right there. So that was a pretty good guess on my behalf, and I didn't even know it was going to work that way. But yeah, if we're just sketching it, generally it's not that big a deal that we know exactly where all the points are. We just need to make sure we've got a basic shape. And that's a big difference between, and I tell my students this, if the problem is to sketch the graph versus graph the equation. If you're told to graph the equation, then you want to be a lot more strict on making sure everything, absolutely. You would need to test, well, where, how far down does this point go? You know, that sort of thing. 
All right. Then if y'all will give me your email addresses, and it doesn't have to be your Calhoun, just whatever y'all check, and I will uh, send you copies of the PDF that we just made and uh, copy to the link, a link to the uh, video.